We've already formed a quorum. Let's start. Item 1 on the agenda, information paper issued since the last meeting. Paper CB bracket 1133 stroke 12 to 13 bracket 01. Land registry statistics in October 2012 provided by the administration. Item 2 on the agenda, items for discussion at the next meeting. Members can go through the list of follow-up actions and the list of outstanding items for discussion. We also received paper 242 bracket 01, which is a letter from Mr. Christopher Chong, dated the 27th of November, requesting early discussion of the policy on the redevelopment of old public rental housing estates. Together with the deputy chairman, I discussed with the administration to see whether we can advance the item. Earlier, when answering an oral question, if I remember correctly, the administration said that it had no plan for the time being for the redevelopment of the old PRH estate, or one of the estates in the paper. Our next meeting will be held on the 7th of January at 2.30 p.m. And we'll discuss uh, subdivided flats and head 771-PWP-B0790-I in relation to Area 13, Hong Shui Q is about a, a PTI. And then other housing initiatives uh, and the creation of directorate post to launch the new HOS. Any questions? If not, we move on to the next item on the agenda. Item 3, proposed creation of directorate post for implementation of the residential properties first hand sales ordinance. Please invite the departmental officials to enter the conference room. We now we're now on item 3, proposed creation of directorate posts for implementation of the residential properties first hand sales ordinance. Is paper CB1222 bracket 01. The administration proposes to create directorate posts to implement the ordinance. We welcome from the administration the Permanent Secretary for Transport and Housing, Mr. Peskert. The Deputy Secretary for Transport and Housing, Mr. Eugene Fung. And the Principal Assistant Secretary for Transport and Housing, Mrs. Hedy Chu. I'd now like to invite the Administration to introduce the paper to us. Mr. Peskert. Um, the purpose of this paper is to seek members' views on and support for a proposal to create one administrative officer staff grade B and one principal executive officer post with effect from the 1st of April 2013, that's next year, for the enforcement authority to be set up to implement the residential properties first hand sales ordinance. Uh, this ordinance was passed by uh, members in LegCo in, the, in late June of 2012 and at the time we gave an undertaking to bring the ordinance and the enforcement authority into operation within 12 months after the ordinance was enacted. Indeed, our current target is to bring both of them into operation by the end of April. The ordinance sets out detailed requirements in relation to sales brochures, price lists, show flats, disclosure of transaction information, advertisements, sales arrangements, and the mandatory provision for the preliminary agreement for sale and purchase and the agreement for sales and purchase for the sale of all first-hand residential properties. It also contains provisions to prohibit misrepresentation and the dissemination of false or misleading information. Offences are created for the contravention of the provisions in the ordinance. To facilitate early implementation of the ordinance and to maximize the use of public resources, the Enforcement Authority will be set up under the Transport and Housing Bureau. It will perform enforcement functions, carry out public education, and maintain an electronic database on individual first-hand residential developments. Having regard to the job requirements, political sensitivity, level of responsibility, and complexity of the tasks involved, as well as the need to make prompt decisions, 
We consider it necessary that the head of the enforcement agency be ranked at AO staff grade B and that the deputy head be filled by a general grade officer ranked at PEO level. Apart from the AO staff grade B and the PEO, the enforcement authority will have a multidisciplinary team of 30 non-directorate civil service posts, including building surveyor, estate surveyor, executive officer, housing manager, information officer grade staff, as well as technical and administrative supporting staff. We have critically examined the possibility for the existing deputy directors and the senior principal executive officer in the housing department to absorb the additional workload of the proposed AO staff grade B and PEO posts through internal reshuffling of their work. But as explained in detail in the panel paper, these officers are already fully stretched with their own duties. They're simply not able to absorb the additional workload without affecting the discharge of their existing responsibilities. I would add that it is crucial that the two director posts are created by the 1st of April 2013 in order to allow the ordinance and the enforcement authority to come into operation by the end of that month. I urge members to support the creation of the two directorate posts, and with members' support, we will seek the Establishment Subcommittee's endorsement on the proposal in January of 2013. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Members, any questions? Four minutes each. Yes, please raise your hands. Mr. Lung Chika. Mr. Lung Chicha, yes, who else? If caught him. Oh, sorry, I missed you. Kokka Ki, if caught him, Lung Chicha. All right, four minutes each. Dr. Kokka Ki, four minutes, question and answer. Mr. Chairman, I believe that we are to create these posts uh, to monitor the first-hand sales. Undoubtedly, we need these posts. For the preparation work, we already had a supernumerary post. I can see from the paper some estimation of workload. For example, 2% uh, or 400 complaints, 280 of which uh, would need follow-up action, etc., etc. Well, I think these are assumptions. We hope uh, that we can make good use of public money. Now, for these assumptions, does it mean that if in future, well, I don't know how the property hegemony will go about it. You may have to create more posts. You may need to employ over 100 people to monitor the four major property developers. Well, what I'm saying is that if after a period of time there are no obvious irregularities, do you still need such a framework, a big framework, with uh, more than 30 people? And this authority will be a statutory body. How much manpower will you need? I mean, apart from regular inspection, how much more manpower you need? Will you need, uh, I see you need one information officer here. Can somebody in your headquarters help? How much uh, PR or information work he has to do? Colleague, to, to supplement. Um, I think the first thing is that what we've tried to do is estimate um, need as close as we can. You're quite right, it is an estimation. Um, and we will, of course, uh, monitor the situation. Um, but, of course, handling complaints is only part of the workload anyway, because, of course, uh, the function of the um, authority will be to uh, facilitate the work of um, the different agencies involved in uh, first-hand sales. So they will be issuing guidelines, they will be uh, vetting um, advertising and all of that. So that work will happen regardless of the complaints. So we think that the, the current uh, proposal is, is reasonable at this stage of the um, of the game. I can't say that we would uh, not have to come back for more if it turns out that the workload is greater. I hope it isn't. 
because yeah. if the workload is greater, it means there are more problems. In case we, we cannot meet, you know, the numbers of uh, exactly. follow-up on post execution as you, um, you know, estimate, will there be a chance that, you know, we reduce the manpower in the future? Um, I, I would I'm not honestly be able to tell you at this stage. It's just too so early. So when will be the time that you review the structures again? again. <laughs> So, as I say, that's something that we will keep in, in view. You asked about um, the second point. The, I, I want to assure members that the unit has to be self-contained because there are not resources elsewhere within the Bureau or the Department to provide additional help. The only additional help outside the unit will come from um, the Department of Justice in terms of prosecutions, and that we're dealing with separately with the Department of Justice. Perhaps um, uh, Eugene hey, can supplement. Hey, uh, Mr. Fong, well, allow me to supplement. In the Bureau and the Department, we have a special duties division, which is a supernumerary setup. Its main tasks in the last couple of years was to oversee the legislation work. There was a steering committee which compiled a report and then there was public consultation. And now after the enactment of the ordinance, this authority has to be set up, guidelines have to be prepared, etc., etc. This supernumerary set up will, upon the establishment of the authority, well, they will have an overlapping period, but that will be very short, longest a month, and then the unit will disappear. And then the authority, with 32 colleagues as sent out in the paper, enforce the ordinance, do public education, and every now and then promulgate guidelines. To handle complaints is only part of the authorities' work in future. In actual fact, we can see that in the past few years, on the average, we have 60 to 70 or even 80 new properties on sale with sales brochures and price lists. The sales brochures have to be updated every three months and the price lists have to be updated every time. So sales arrangement, show flats, sales brochures, price lists, etc. will have to be inspected. So even if there's no complaint, the authority will have to do monitoring work. I want to say you find Right, uh, please uh, pay attention. We have four minutes questions and answers included. But I'll let you finish just now anyway. Let's see for him. Thank you, Chairman. Now, about this ordinance, residential properties first and sales ordinance, towards the end of the last term of LegCo, all political parties scrutinized the bill uh, and passed the bill in a short period of time because we feel that in relation to the sales practice in the market right now, in terms of the use of um, the um, gross floor area, um, this is not desirable. And after passing the bill, the SRPA, the Sales of First Hand Residential Properties Authority, is the enforcement authority of the ordinance. And the DAB supports the SRPA because definitely. There should be an enforcement agency for the implementation of the ordinance. But uh, a question here. In relation to the work in the future, in particular publicity and public education, it's also covered. So it doesn't only just cover supervision and the inspection of sales brochures, prices, etc. You will actually go up um, to the flats uh, to me take measurements. And um, publicity is also covered. So can you say a bit more about that? And now, um, as far as manpower is concerned, only two uh, direct posts are proposed, 1D3 and 1D1. And there are also 30 other non-directorate level staff. So what is the um, amount of 
expenditure involved. I mean, many of the staff is under the civil service uh, establishment. So do you have the actual figures on the annual expenditure, Mr. Fong? Thank you, Chairman. Now, the SRPA is tasked to conduct public education, and we're looking at several things. Uh, one is to let the public know that in the future, only sellable floor area can be used for the sale of first-hand residential properties. Secondly, the public should be educated uh, so that they know our price list will have to be announced three days in advance and seven days in advance sales brochures will have to be made available by developers and the sales brochures must be updated every three months and this is to let the public know the rights they're entitled to and the information that they're allowed to have access under the, uh, the law and uh, all these are important. As for information officer, one of the major tasks is to promote public education in this regard. A member asked about the future expenditure of the authority. In fact, in Para 24, uh, this has been set out, and that is for the 30, I mean, for the two directorate posts, the amount is uh, 468 or 4.68 million. As for the remaining 30 posts, the amount is 23.8 million. Well, because this is a new ordinance, I hope uh, that more should be done uh, on publicity because uh, this should not be done only by the information officer, by the but by the authority as a whole. Mr. Lan Chi-Chang. Thank you, Chairman. The SRPA is an important element that supports the implementation of the ordinance. So I support the, the establishment as well. But since this is a new body, as far as manpower is concerned, I wonder if more can be done apart from what is said by DS, for example, in the future, um, whether they can provide a performance pledge and for simple cases, uh, whether a reply can be given to the complainants within a certain time frame. Uh, this is important. The other point is uh, we're still six months away from the establishment of the authority. So during the transitional period, has the administration considered that in relation to the relevant requirement under the ordinance, the use of sellable floor area and the requirements on the sales brochures, etc., uh, amendments will be made um, to the existing legislation first. first one, I think it's a very good idea. We should have performance pledges. We will follow up on that, definitely. Um, perhaps uh, Eugene can answer to the second question. Um. Yes, Mr. Fong. Thank you, Chairman. Now, on the use of sellable floor areas, the um, EAA has already issued uh, a, a guidance, and that is starting from 1st of January next year for property transactions. Information on the sellable floor area should be provided or must be provided. So on uh, promoting the wider use of uh, SFA, uh, we are already making an effort even before the ordinance takes effect. And Throughout the past several months, we have been communicating with the industry, including the reader and the law society, and on the drafting of the guidelines, we have maintained a communication with them so that they understand the um, future requirements. Anything to follow up? No? Mr. Wu Chi Wai. Thank you, Chairman. Well, of course, the SRPA should be, should be adequately staffed. Now, two points. First of all, there will be uh, 30 odd staff, including the two directorate posts. So, 
are you going to start recruitment or do they come from the existing establishment or from the civil service? Second question. Now, on the several directions mentioned and the anticipated workload, are there any objective criteria so as to assure us uh, that uh, so m m much manpower is needed? Because the ordinance aims at ensuring that no property developer will provide fraudulent or, or um, false or misleading information. I can't quite imagine why so much power, manpower is needed to take up the investigation and monitoring work. The other point is that you've said many times that under the new ordinance, the sellable floor area will be used as the standard in property transactions. So does it mean that this will cover second-hand property transactions as well? Will this authority deal with complaints related to second-hand property as well? All right, who will take this question, Mr. Fong? In relation to the 30-odd staff under the SRPA, uh, looking at Annex C, you can see that um, all posts um, do come from existing civil service establishment. As for the actual manpower, uh, because the, these proposed posts will take effect from the 1st of April, and we're going to look for suitable uh, offices from relevant departments to fill these posts. As for workload, there are two things uh, as our basis. Now, first, on the checking of sales brochures and property transaction, even advertisements, we have detailed requirements. In the future, after receiving all the information, the authority will actively conduct inspections, because only by doing so will we know whether the law has been complied with. For first-hand property sale, there are 70 to 80 uh, pro projects per year, and uh, the sales brochures will have to be reviewed every three months, and price lists will have to be revised every time. Uh, changes are made, and uh, the, uh, as well as advertisements, there are TV advertisements as well as uh, paper advertisements or printed um, advertisements. So this is quite a huge workload. As for complaints, there are uh, annually 20,000 first-hand units produced, so um, taking 4% as the uh, percentage, every year there will be at least 400 complaints, and some may be more complex cases and some cases may have to be referred to the DOJ for considering whether prosecution uh, should be initiated. Third question. This ordinance seeks to regulate sale of first-hand residential properties, not second-hand residential properties. But like I said, the EAA, to tie it in with the requirements under this ordinance, has already requested the estate agents to provide information on sellable floor area in property transactions. Mr. Christopher Jung. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to follow up on these questions as well. Now, is the administration being forward-looking? The, the primary and the secondary markets are both active. Uh, very often, the first-hand property will soon become second-hand or even third-hand property. So uh, shouldn't they be covered under the ordinance? And I think the administration should be forward-looking once this authority is established. Will the administration consider setting up an independent authority that regulates second-hand properties as well? Because sometimes alterations or UBWs are involved in these second-hand properties. And, um, Ordinary citizens may not know about them, let alone the chief executive. As therefore, in the long run, please tell us whether this authority will be developed into an independent authority, whether it will be expanded gradually. Mr. Fong, let me first explain when passing the 
bill, we had a detailed deliberation on the scope of the ordinance, and that is we only regulate first-hand residential properties. That's because under most circumstances, for sale of first-hand residential properties, the, um, there is no level playing field for buyer and the uh, vendor, because a vendor is usually the property developer, whereas for second-hand property transaction, the vendor is uh, very often um, a, a former buyer as well. The ordinance requires the vendors to do a lot of things, for example, preparation of brochure list, price li bro sales brochure, price list, property transaction register, and they also need to abide by requirements uh, as far as, as advertisements are concerned. If we impose the same requirements on a second-hand property vendor, then there might be difficulties. And for the sales brochures, price list, transaction register, etc., all the information will be contained in a centralized database in the future. So when the, an individual owner sells the first-hand property to, in the secondary market, through our website, all the information, including the, the prices, etc., will be made available on our website. You haven't answered this question on an independent authority. This is something that we, we certainly are uh, prepared to look at in due course. Obviously, my priority now is to get the uh, units set up and working, make sure that the legislation is brought into effect properly at the end of April, um, and then we'll monitor how this proceeds. But certainly, we have not at all ruled out the possibility in future of having this set up as a statutory body. So that's something we'll, we'll, we'll rehearse. Mr. Chung. All right, so um, it should be passed as soon as possible, but we'll give an undertaking, say, two years or three years' time. You will conduct a review on the scope, etc., and will you consider... Uh, okay, that is whether you will review. Who's to take this question? As I said, I haven't got a timetable, but certainly we take note of the member's comment on that. Okay. Next, Mr. Chair Wai Chun. Thank you, Chairman. Of course, I support the establishment of the SRPA. The ultimate goal of this ordinance is to protect consumers. Now, I'd like to ask a question on this point. That is, staff will be deployed to the SRPA, and after redeploy redeployment, what will the be the impact on the housing department? And I've also purchased properties before, and very often developers will have a series of events, um, say promotion, etc. So first of all, they have to comply with the requirements under the ordinance, but also we should consider uh, the preemptive aspect, and that is to say, draft line tr guidelines should be properly drafted to remind developers not to challenge the requirements and consumers or property buyers will stand to benefit so there are different ways of selling first-hand properties. So as far as people are concerned, um, the directorate officers should be familiar with this trade, first of all. Because there will be quite a number of tricks, so prevention is better than cure. That's point number one. Just now, you mentioned that there will be 70 to 80 first-hand sales but I understand that for each sale, there may be more than one round of publicity. In my experience, there had been as many as seven to eight rounds of publicity for one first-hand sale or first-hand sales for one property. Now, we're talking about office hours, but in the property industry, they always work outside office hours, sometimes even in the evenings. The procedures and tactics may influence the potential buyers. 
a potential buyer may make a wrong decision in a misleading environment. So I hope that uh, you will pay attention to the working hours of uh, these staff members. Who will answer this? Let's go, Mr. Fung to answer oh. the second. Um, oh. the, the, the question about the impact on the housing department. Um, obviously, because the staff will come from throughout the civil service, I'm hoping that the impact will be very limited on the housing department. But um, obviously, we will have to take steps to make sure that it is. Um, certainly, the uh, administrative officer and the executive officer will be provided by general grades and by the admin officer grade, uh, not from the department. The other staff will be recruited through the normal in-service recruitment process, and that's usually open to staff from any department, not just from housing department. So I, I think I can assure you that uh, the impact will be spread throughout the civil service, not just focused on one department. But I, I do want to uh, accept entirely the point you made that we need staff that have, are familiar with the workings of the industry. And so that's going to be one of the requirements that we'll be looking at particularly in terms of our recruitment. So people that have a, a, the relevant knowledge and background. Perhaps you can Mr. Fong, as regards the first-hand sales tactics, under the ordinance, the price list has to be published three days in advance, sales brochure seven days in advance, and so forth. All these are to assist the potential buyers to know what flats will be put on sale or even the transaction records. So, relatively speaking, in future, there will be a higher degree of transparency. Mr. Lam Kok Hong and then Dr. Fernando Zhang. Mr. Pescott, I really want to commend you. You have not built a wall. Rather, you demolished your UBW. Well, Mr. Long Kok Hong, please do not digress. Oh, I'm not to scold officials, but now I'm praising Mr. Pescott, uh, and you still prevent me from doing so. Mr. Pescott, please accept uh, my blessings and appreciation for you because you are really wise and uh, you did the right thing. So I'm confident in you in this exercise. I believe you won't be like CY. Well, it's just like uh, covering a UBW with a wall. CY said that uh, that's tantamount to not having a UBW. Well, Mr. Long Po Hong, please come back to the agenda item. Well, but Mr. Pascard and his team are officials. Oh, all right, all right, I'll come back to the agenda item. Well, this is our creation. Without the ordinance, we won't need the authority to do law enforcement. So, it's our baby. Now, I just want to know, will the authority do inspection? or monitoring. And uh, when a property developer is to launch a sale, it has uh, to submit all the documents to you and have the documents uploaded to the internet for monitoring. So, even if you don't see the documents, uh, the public will see them. So that's all right for inspection and monitoring. But you see, the property developers are very cunning. Uh, you mentioned three days in advance, seven days in advance, blah, blah, blah. What if they do not follow the provisions in the ordinance? So I hope that uh, you will adopt a strong approach in enforcing the law. And what if the land developer adopt a delaying tactic? Mr. Fong, well, Mr. Chairman, in the authority, they will do two things. First of all, under the ordinance, the vendor has to publish the sales brochures, price lists, registers of transactions, sales arrangement announcements, etc., etc. They have to pass all these documents to the authority. And then if there's a sales office, our colleagues will visit uh, the sales office and inspect it. 
So it's not just documentary work. Our colleagues will carry out on-site inspection, and for various provisions, we have a wide range of penalties for regulatory. Provisions, for example, the submission of drawings, the highest fine may be a hundred thousand dollars, and if the impact is direct or pecuniary in in nature, the fine can be as high as five hundred thousand dollars or even a million dollars for misleading and false information, etc. The fine can be. Five hundred thousand dollars to one million dollars, and imprisonment for six months to seven years. All these have been written into the ordinance. Well, it's useless to find them because they can reap huge proceeds from first-hand sales. Mr. Pescott, I support you, Dr. Fernando Jo. Mr. Chairman, the Labour Party, of course, supports the establishment of the authority. I think it comes rather late and too weak, also, because the property developers are really very strong, and they try to shirk their responsibilities. M many members of the public are spending their lifelong savings on just one flat, but. The sales brochures, the degree of transparency, etc., etc., may not be sufficient. Many consumers don't know what flats they are buying, what the area is. The drawings, the publicity materials, etc., are all cheating people. So you have to adopt a forceful approach in law enforcement. Is there any pledge on the part of the bureau? For example, after how many days, or or after how much time, upon the receipt of a complaint, will you be able to give a response? And what about the investigation and monitoring results? And there are bound to be grey areas. You may consider. Certain practices, unscrupulous or malpractices, but what can you do? Maybe you should also monitor the websites as well. If you're only purely handling complaints and conducting investigations, that's not enough. I hope that every year you can come to this panel to give us a report, just like、uh, the. EOC and the and the ombudsman, they do the same. So I support you. Would you please refer to our opinion, Mr. Pascoe? Mr. Fong, to answer the other parts,、um, certainly、uh, we're always very happy to come to the、uh, the panel to answer questions on anything that's within our purview. And of course, because this will be under the bureau,、uh, it will be part of our normal reporting process to report on the activities of the、uh, of the new agency. So I think there will be quite a lot of dialogue on this, and we certainly anticipate that. Perhaps、uh, Eugene, you can follow up. Ah, Fong Sir, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, um, Department of Public Service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In terms of the performance pledge of the authority, as a government department, we do have guidelines as to. The time frame of providing a response to a complaint, and we'll have our dedicated web page with、uh, electronic dissemination of first-hand sales, covering sales brochures, price lists, registers of transactions, etc. We'll regularly publish、uh, statistics that are. Interested to consumers,、uh, like the number of sales, number of flats sold, etc. As for unforeseeable malpractices in sales or unforeseeable circumstances, we'll keep in close contact with the reader, in the hope that、uh, we'll all do our job well. Mr. Chairman, will they monitor in-house sales? Well, Mr. Chairman, 
For first-time sales, a price list must be available, and a sales brochure must be available, save for those exempted uh, scenarios. For the first round, any more? According to our time schedule, we may discuss up to 3.20 p.m. Well, Mr. Lam Kok Hong will ask uh, for a second time, and I will also spend my four minutes as well. So, for the first round, I'll ask my questions first. Now, this authority is to regulate the property developers. They are so-called big tigers, not ordinary tigers. If it is discovered that a property developer has breached the ordinance, what or which level of officials will decide on whether or not to take out a prosecution? At the moment, the media and the public do have huge doubts about the property developers. At present, if a case reaches the ICAC, the ICAC will have an independent committee to monitor it. In future, are we going to have an independent committee to oversee the authority as well, just like that which oversees the ICAC? I'm afraid that only one or two senior officials will be making the decision and after their retirement, these one or two senior officials uh, may benefit from their decision or their lenient decisions. This one, I have a lot of faith in my colleagues, and I certainly don't have the sort of cynical view that people get deferred benefits, if that's what you're suggesting. This is never something that you can do in, an, in isolation. Uh, any decision on prosecution involves a, a number of people, and most importantly, the final decision rests with the Department of Justice, not with the authority. And I think that's a very important point of principle here, and we will be following that, that absolutely. So I, I, I see that the system that we've put in place with members' support uh, will provide us with an adequate um, uh, approach to allow us to ensure that necessary prosecutions are taken forward in the right time and in the right manner. Having said that, of course, as I said earlier, uh, we are, remain open-minded about the need for a, an authority in future, and we will revisit that, certainly. Um, but at this stage, my priority is to get this particular model up and running quickly as, as, I, as I can, because I think, um, as members have quite rightly pointed out, the community expects us to move forward very quickly on this, and I think it's incumbent on us uh, to, to do so. I also fully expect that every decision that's taken by the authority will be subject to quite a lot of scrutiny through the media uh, and through our normal systems of, of oversight. So I, I, I'm confident that decisions will be taken in the best interest and fully in accordance with the law. Do you want to supplement on that? Yes, uh, in relation to what is meant by breach of the law, well, the ordinance is very clear. There is uh, not so much grey area uh, in between. So in our future investigation work, when we discover a breach, the case will be referred to the Department of Justice, but it's up to the DOJ to decide whether to prosecute or not. Of course, I'm confident in civil servants, but I think that the system is important. But Mr. Pascot said uh, that you keep an open mind to members' suggestions. I'm happy to hear that. I hope that after the authority is set up, say in a year's time or after a period of time, a review can be conducted. Uh, and consideration be given to a com independent committee on the supervision of this authority and see if they have um, properly enforced the law. This is very important in ensuring public's confidence in the authority. In particular, uh, whether any deferred um, um, benefits are involved 
of course, I support it as well. Now, Ms., uh, Mr. Kenneth Long uh, is uh, speaking for the first round, so I'll allow Mr. Long to speak first, followed by Mr. Long Kwok Hong for the second round. Now, for the authority, this is just a government department, actually, although it's called an authority. Well, has the administration considered whether ultimately there is a need to set up a statutory monitoring authority, just like the EAA in enforcing this ordinance, Mr. Pascott? As I've said, this is something that we're, we have an open mind about. And in fact, it was discussed uh, during the passage of the bill as an option. But as we explained at the time, we felt that there was an urgency to get this authority up and running as quickly as we could. In order to do so, we did look at the option of, of moving straight to a statutory body, but it takes a lot more time because you have to create the body, you then have to set up all the mechanisms thereafter, they have to recruit. It, it, it's much quicker to go this route. So that's why we're going this route, but we certainly don't rule out the prospect of uh, a statutory body in due course. Chairman, one follow-up question, but I need to declare interest. I am a former um, director of the board of the EAA, and uh, very often I see that when the government sets up statutory bodies, there could be overlapping of resources. I have one question for the administration to consider. If you set up this SRPA in future, please consider the possibility of uh, having synergy with the EAA, and that is, for example, you can set up uh, something like uh, an EAA um, together with this function so that uh, a lot of supportive functions can be shared, for example, in terms of uh, legal advice and human resources and other back office functions, that they can share the resources and public money can be saved. I hope that the administration can also um, listen to our views. To that suggestion, there are in fact, a number of models that we could look at for a statutory body. Um, and the sort of model that you're describing is something, I guess, like the, the new communications authority, which combined the former teller and then the former um, uh, office of the, uh, what's it called? Well, telecommunications, that's right. So there are, there are a number of models we, we could look at. And I, I can assure you we'll, we will look at those. Oh, oh, oh. All right, so the administration will keep me open mind. Mr. Lai, one minute, your turn. This is the experience I get in the Lehman Brothers mini bond incident. Can you ask a pr prospective buyer to um, record the process uh, in audio or video? Because if you talk about financial products, sometimes only 500,000 is involved. But when you talk about a, property, a piece of property, it may be $5 million or $10 million. Uh, you know, with C.Y. Long's um, policy of allowing 5,000 white form applicants to purchase flats without paying pr premium in the HOS market, well, prices will continue to go up. So if you do this, you will... Uh, curb any misleading practices, and this is already very lax on developers. That's not the case for the stock market, so we we'll consider making recording of the property transactions. Brief response. There is no such requirement under the ordinance, but if the buyers and vendors uh, reach an agreement and they decide to go ahead with recording, the ordinance that's not forbid them from doing so. But we consider requiring them to do so. Uh, just like uh, Mr. Norman Chan, uh, he is suggesting that for financial products, recording should be conducted. Well, this is not the requirement under the ordinance. And in future, the authority cannot um, mandate the both parties um, to do so. But if this is considered good practice, they can make their arrangements. All right. In fact, um, our time for this agenda is up, and uh, the conclusion is that uh, members who have spoken are in support of this paper. So after we give, an, uh, give our endorsement, they will submit the proposal to the ESC for the creation of posts. So any objections? No. So uh, it's uh, unanimous uh, support.
so the panel supports this paper. You can submit your proposal to the ESC as scheduled. All right, moving on to the fourth item. Performance of environmental targets and initiatives in 2011-12. LC paper CB bracket 1231 slash 1213 bracket 03. That's the administration's paper on performance of environmental targets and initiatives in 2011-12. And also another paper CB bracket 1231 slash 1213 bracket 04. Um, that is a background brief on environmental friendly designs, green measures, and energy saving initiatives implemented in PLH states prepared by the Electrical Secretariat. So, let me welcome representatives from the administration for attending this part of the meeting. Uh, may I invite departmental representatives to take us through the paper with the aid of a PowerPoint? Yes, thank you, Mr. Pascoe. If I, if I may. Uh, Mr. Chairman, since uh, 1999, the Hong Kong Housing Authority has had an environmental policy to promote healthy living in a green environment. Environmental targets and initiatives have also been established to effectively manage the overall implementation of the environmental policy. Uh, we'd like to take this opportunity to brief members on the performance of the Housing Authority in respect of its environmental targets and initiatives for 2011 and 12. Just as a bit of background, we've set out 39 targets in six environmental aspects for the fiscal year 2011-12, covering energy efficiency, water conservation, greening, waste management, control of hazardous materials, and environmental awareness and participation. I can report that all of these targets have been fully met except one target, which was to replace electromagnetic ballasts of the light fittings with electronic ballasts in all existing rental blocks. Uh, the problem there was that we need to procure new contracts for this retrofitting work. In addition to the above, I understand that some members have expressed concern over food waste recycling. Uh, I'm pleased to inform you that at present we are conducting trial schemes to recycle food waste into compost in public housing estates both on-site and off-site. Depending on the results of these trials, we will consider if there should be a wider application of food waste recycling in public housing estates. Looking ahead, we've set out, I think, challenging but pragmatic targets to gauge our performance for 2012-13, and we will make every effort to achieve the various environmental, social and economic targets to maintain a sustainable public housing program. We have a short presentation for you, and I'd like to invite uh, Ada, if she could, to brief members on the details of our performance, on our targets and initiatives, as well as touch on the food waste recycling scheme. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. Deputy Director, Ms. Ada Fung. Now, apart from the relevant environmental policy and legislation, we also formulate our as, uh, environmental policy in three areas, uh, including the planning and construction of new estates, the operation of existing estates, and the day-to-day um, -day operation of offices. To minimize the impact on our environment, we incorporate environmental initiatives and develop green procurement policies throughout our planning and design, construction and demolition, etc. At the beginning of each year, we will set down the relevant environmental targets and initiatives and we review our work every three months. We set down 39 targets covering six environmental aspects and um, Director already mentioned the six aspects. I shall not repeat. Now, in relation to uh, food waste recycling, we work with the EPD and we are conducting a trial scheme. And under the scheme, in Tincheng Estate and Tinchui Wai and Qicheng Estate in Qiwan Shan, we have installed food waste composters for on site food waste recycling. And we are working with three green groups to conduct trial schemes on off site food waste recycling in five public housing estates. 
Uh, we transport food waste to recycling plants outside the estates and will continue to carry out review on these food waste initiatives. So I'll move on to talk about our environmental performances here. First, on environmental initiatives and planning and construction of new housing estates, we obtained 70 energy certificates for the newly completed public domestic blocks, and we explored and studied the use of more energy efficient equi equipment. Now, for Lamtin phases 7 and 8, we reviewed the performance of trial light e emitting diode LED lighting system, and we monitored and reviewed the performance of the prototype of LED bulkheads at Chijing Estate. And in five completed pilot pro projects, we completed the environmental lighting controls using a two-level lighting system at the communal areas of the domestic blocks. Furthermore, we explored and studied the use of green design for building services equipment. And they include, first, reviewing the performance of the first trial PV system at Lamtin in phases 7 and 8, completing the second trial of the PV panel system at East Harbour Crossing Site Phase 5, installing one to two solar or, solar or wind hybrid lights in all new estates for education purpose, and number four, conducting carbon emission estimation for all projects with domestic blocks at the detailed design stage. And on water conservation, we conducted a research on the materials and standards of water closet suites to reduce flushing water consumption. And we provided rain ha water harvesting system at Tong Tao Phase 9 and East Harbour Crossing Site Phase 5 to reduce irrigation water consumption. And on greening, we completed all targets, and that is the minimum requirement of one tree per 15 public ha rental housing flats target have been met. And um, we have also achieved an overall target of 30 green coverage uh, with a minimum of 20% at the planning brief stage. We've also provided green treatment to all the new slopes. And we've also engaged local residents to take part in, in, uh, in the Action Seed Link program uh, so that early plant can be raised in new housing estates. And for the new uh, PLH in the design stage, we introduce communal planting areas in the master landscape layout plans so that residents can take part in the uh, greening uh, activities. Now on waste management, we stipulated in the contract um, that uh, pulverized fuel ash as partial cement replacement material in structural concrete uh, should be used, and recycled rock fill and recycled sub base materials should be used. As for timber doors, all cores should be uh, all cores of timber doors should use softwood timber. And during the construction stage, for temporary works. Timber should come from sustainable source and um, not from virgin forest products. On control of hazardous materials, in redevelopment projects, we implemented uh, a bestos abatement program covering 10 demolished building blocks and comprising 8 domestic blocks and 2 school blocks to abate the remaining asbestos containing materials in HA managed properties. Then in terms of the enhancement of environmental awareness and participation, we require the contractors on all sides of all new building, demolition, piling and civil engineering contracts submit and implement environmental management plan ban the use of incandescent light bulbs for temporary lighting, use generators with quality-powered mechanical equipment labels, install water recycling facilities, and restrict vehicle speed. We we'll also stipulate requirements to adopt hard-paved construction in all new building and piling contracts and to use precast concrete components in all new building contracts. As for energy efficiency, we monitor and review the performance of LED bucket light fittings in selected existing PRH blocks. For water conservation, we've installed water-saving devices 
in the toilets of 21 shopping centers, namely sensor-controlled tap, sensor-controlled urinal flush valve, and so forth. For greening, we've nurtured a green environment and promoted tenants' awareness and participation in greening by organizing tree planting days in 10 estates, developing community gardens in 10 estates, and providing greening activities in 20 estates through EMAX. In 18 estates, uh, we re-landscaped re and upgraded the existing landscape facilities through the Landscape Improvement Program and have set up thematic gardens at Choi Wan and Sha Kok. We have improved the appearance of 10 slopes at five estates by providing planters for shrubs and creepers as well as applying hydro seeding on Chunam services. For waste management, we carried out promotion at source and adopted green management initiatives by implementing the source separation of domestic waste program in all estates. We set up collection counters in all estates and encouraged the residents to collect domestic recyclables through incentive scheme. Now you can see these to this chart and see that uh, we have attained all our objectives. Sorry, in terms of uh, greening. For waste management, for asbestos materials, we carry out inspection twice a year. And we've also carried out emergency repair of underground asbestos cement water mains for all estates. For the enhancement of environmental awareness and participation, we collaborated with green groups to conduct the statewide environmental awareness campaign and education program and carried out post-program surveys. We continue to enhance community awareness by launching waste reduction and recycling campaigns in PRH estates. And we also arranged joint programs with green groups, NGOs, and EMACs. Well, as shown in this chart, we've attained our object objectives. And on this chart, you can see that uh, we've saved uh, water consumption by 17% an improvement over the preceding year. As for environmental initiatives in Office at Work, we have a tree planting day to encourage our staff members to participate in environmental protection activities. We've achieved our objectives for the control of damaging materials We've actually regulated the mercury materials. <coughs> and we've uh, followed up uh, the HA staff survey on awareness and strengthened our training and publicity programs. We've also set up display boards to disseminate the image, uh, the message of environmental protection. We are very enterprising in formulating our objectives in the next year. We'll ensure that all our programs and activities in our estates are sustainable. Mr. Fred Ringfong, no white quark. Mak Mei Kun, Wu Chi Wai, and Kok Ka Ki have signified their wish to speak. Also, Dr. Fernando Chang. Will four minutes for each member? Question and answer. Mr. Frederick Fong. Mr. Chairman, we discuss this topic every year. I think we need to appreciate the effort of the Housing Department. It has been doing a lot of work on this. We need to commend them. Well, 
a third of our PRH estates are still managed by the housing department. Well, hardware, greening, electricity consumption, solar lights, etc., are still being managed by the department. But I think the department has acted too slowly in terms of public participation. Take, for example, food wastes. My estate, Lycock Estate, does have a program which is conducted by an NGO. Every night we are to place our food wastes into big buckets and then at around 12 midnight, uh, the operator or contractor will come along to collect the food wastes. But we're only talking about uh, 300 estates, covering 1,000 households only. But 1,000 out of uh, 700,000 households is really too low a percentage. It's not quite fair to the housing department. The housing department has the network. Can we bring in also the EPD and many other NGOs so that we can launch a territory-wide program on collecting and recycling food wastes? I think we have to act more expeditiously. Secondly, in many overseas jurisdictions, they no longer collect food wastes. The food wastes are actually turned into fertilizers locally for local agriculture. And you see, in Hong Kong, we don't know where to, s oh, uh, in fact, in overseas jurisdictions, it's very expensive to actually sell the food wastes. So they recycle and reuse the food wastes uh, locally. Well, you must allow the officials time to answer your questions. Well, I'd like to say something about electricity consumption. If the SARG is not going to do anything, the HD should do something. For those households, which use less electricity than the last quarter, rent should be reduced accordingly to serve as incentives. Try and keep it short. Um, the food waste trials that we're carrying out are in fact in conjunction with EPD and NGOs. I have to say, um, the things that we've already experienced with on-site composting are quite severe. Um, smell problems, uh, odour problems, um, the collection issue, how do you collect or make sure that they're separated so you get just food waste and not other waste. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not overly optimistic about on-site separation. However, we're now trying uh, off-site separation um, uh, in five estates. Uh, I think that's going to be probably more viable in the context of high-density, high-rise living that we have in our public housing estates. Um, but we, we need to ad assess all of these options before we commit fully to rolling out a scheme because the last thing I want to do is to create a health hazard in, on our, in our public housing estates by food waste being left unattended, causes vermin and rats and all of that sort of stuff. We've got to be very careful. I cannot afford the risk uh, of this whatever trial we go through to go wrong. That's why we are deliberately starting cautious. But I can say we are working with EBD to make sure that uh, whatever we do is properly analyzed and properly assessed before we, we take the full commitment. Our objective, of course, is to reduce the, the amount of waste that's produced generally, and we have to work with uh, our tenants, and we have to educate them, and we have to make sure that they understand the benefits to themselves as well. So there's a few issues here, um, and I'm happy to... Uh, to report back on that in future when we've, when we've assessed the trial in more, more detail. Um, as far as um, uh, the usage of electricity, we, we do have some initiatives. 
um, in terms of, as you've heard, use of uh, photovoltaic cells, in terms of uh, replacing um, lighting systems with LED lighting and two-level two lighting systems in common areas, all of these things. We are also working with our uh, estate management advisory committees to try and educate tenants about the importance of electricity um, uh, usage reduction. At this stage, I have to say that I would not be in favor of providing financial incentives through our uh, rental. As members are aware, our rentals are already very, very low. And if we start giving away even more money, then our, the viability of our public housing program will get into even more trouble. So that option I would not be pursuing. But I think education is the key on this one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Oh. Now, well, I really want members to grasp their time well. All right, four minutes per member covering question and answer. I will stop you once you reach your four minutes. Mr. Lo Waipok, Mr. Chairman, the HA is the biggest developer and landlord in Hong Kong. So, to promote healthy living and green environment in PR8 estates uh, is essential, and this will benefit Hong Kong's prospect in becoming a low carbon city. So, I really have to commend the HA. Now, what about the disposal of waste furniture? Any recovery, recycling, and reuse programs? Any collaboration with other parties? I'm concerned about the PRH construction program on TITAC. Will environmentally friendly technology be introduced? Thirdly, from the charts, we know that the average household waste have uh, remained at the level of 0 0.69 to 0 0.7 kilogram per person per year from 2008 to 2009 to 2011-12. Uh, we did not see any further reduction. So is 0 0.7 kilogram the ultimate level already? Ms. Fong, Deputy Ch uh, Director, thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, in demolition projects, waste furniture will be recovered and distributed to needy persons. As for the reuse of waste construction and demolition materials, wherein when appropriate will make use of sea sludge and waste, for, uh, waste materials, etc. But sometimes we cannot reuse the waste materials. For example, after taking out the rock samples in our foundation works, we may use the rock for fencing in future. For household wastes, 0 0.7 kilogram per person is apparently the saturation level. We hope that with the new initiatives, we can boost that level a bit further. For example, in stage five of Eastern Harbour Crossing, we would encourage the recovery of plastic and paper materials as well as aluminium cans, which will be segregated first to reduce the quantities to be dumped at landfills and will have some test points to monitor the amount of wastes uh, per person in terms of kilograms. Mr. Lowe? Uh. On the first question on the um, unwanted uh, furniture, I don't see any co any actual plan, unlike the uh, plastic bottles and papers. Um, 
I wonder if、um, there are any concrete plans on the recycling of furniture. I will further discuss with the environmental groups and see what in new initiatives can be rolled out in the coming year. Ms. Alice Mack. Okay, my first question on food waste. I support the food waste recycling program because we must tackle the waste problem at source. And now the food waste recycling program is introduced in two housing estates. Can we、uh, extend the scheme to cover more? Because now it's a pilot scheme or, or a trial scheme. And、uh, when will it be introduced to other other estates and for other?、Um, For household other than the 100 households under the schemes, will they, can they also take part in the scheme? And what about older estates? I think the problem may be more serious with older estates, because the waste facilities might be、um, uh, might not be as good. So I think that the food waste、uh, recycling program might help there. Now, according to Uh, your paper, your target is、uh, 18.8 kil kilograms of paper collected, but now、um, it seems that your target is not met. Have you considered what can be done?、Um, we are、uh, actually carrying out two distinct types of trial. The first trial in a couple of estates is on-site、uh, collection and composting. Um, that's been going for a year and a half, nearly two years now. We're assessing the implications of this.、Um, I wouldn't characterise it as particularly successful. The problem is,、um, frankly, you, we need industrial strength composters, and even with a hundred participants, that is almost overwhelming the capacity of the composting system. There really is no capacity to extend it further. Um, and indeed, we are getting complaints、um, about, as I said, noise and other problems with the composting because of the environmental situation that we have in Hong Kong. Now, we keep modifying the, the trial to see if we can improve on it, but it's not particularly successful. That's why we've tried now a second scheme, which is in an, another five estates,、uh, looking at centralised collection and then transportation off-site for composting.、Um, In a, a food waste composter in, in Yuen Long, that's then converted into fish, pig, and other other foodstuffs. That seems to have more potential. The difficulty we have with all of these is、uh, space. I'm afraid Hong Kong just doesn't have the space for us to be able to collect, store, transport, distribute all of this stuff. It's a huge problem. So we, we're, we're having to look at some of these issues at a practical level because you know, theoretically it works. But when it comes down to the practical test,、uh, we're finding some challenges.、Um, as far as、uh, the older estates,、um, again, they are even more problematic because they were never designed for this type of composting, for this type of food collection, or even, for that matter, for separation of other forms of domestic waste. So, you know, you, if you go around to any of our estates, you can see this for yourself. We're having to put collection points in the common areas,、um, and that also causes some problems, environmental problems and other you know, rodents and what have you. So we have to be very careful. I, I, as I said before in my answer to one of the other honourable members, I can't risk a public health outburst because of insufficient capacity to store safely this、uh, product. So we're, we're taking this deliberately. Very cautiously to make sure that at every stage it's done properly and safely. So, and we, but we will continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Go. All right, time's up. Sorry. Let's see if you want to wait for the second round, Mr. Lan Chi Chang. Thank you, Chairman. I share the view of other members on the work of HD and HA. In promoting environmental protection, and with a set of environmental targets and initiatives, they deserve our commendation. As to whether the overall awareness on environmental protection can be raised in public housing estates, apart from the efforts of HA, public participation is very important. I see that、uh, you have a simple. 
you know, relatively simple greening measures or um, energy efficiency, like uh, you, the use of a lighting system in older public uh, housing estates. But as far as interaction with local residents are concerned, little work has been done. Well, it uh, seems that you have um, greening activities, tree planting day, etc. But uh, participation rate is not very high. So perhaps the EMAC should well, work closer with you. For example, they should organize more activities, um, more environmental protection related activities to raise the awareness. Now I have two questions. First on LED lighting. According to my observation, Now you're trying to save energy, so uh, for the corridors, you are replacing 10 with 5 tubes. But for elderly tenants, they find it difficult uh, to even open their doors because of insufficient lighting. So if we can have something like the, the ledge coal, that is, uh, there is a motion sensitive uh, motion sensors, and this will be better. Of course, I cannot ask for uh, this type of lighting in all old estates, but for newer estates, I think that the so-called uh, artificial intelligent lighting system should be installed. Now, greening coverage for new estates, according to the paper, is 30%. Has the roof been taken into account? The new buildings like Lechko and the, the rooftop of the new government buildings, there are roof greening. So for new estates, will HA also uh, provide greening on the rooftop? And you may also consider vertical greening. For example, uh, car parks, shopping arcades, or community facilities, can vertical greening be done? Um. Put briefly, uh, we are putting these new, yeah, we are putting these new uh, lighting systems into new estates, but we have not yet got a program for older estates, mainly because of, frankly, you have to look at the capacity within the estate, so that's a problem. But it is something we're conscious of. We will, we will get round to it. In terms of greening, it covers all forms of um, surface, so rooftops, vertical greening. We already use that quite extensively, and indeed at uh, HA headquarters, we've put in. A, a rooftop greening as part of this effort to, to improve the general environment. Uh, do you want to add anything, Ada? Okay. Um, now about um, rooftop greening for domestic blocks, if they are multi-storey blocks, the higher floors will have to be used for uh, as a fire escape route, so no greening there. But for other space, if possible, we'll try our best to do more greening. As so for vertical greening, where the space is appropriate for greening and where the cost is not expensive, we'll try our best to have vertical greening. Next, Mr. Wu Chi Wai. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to ask questions on two areas. First, on food waste recycling. Of course, we understand that it is difficult to have on site food waste recycling. So, uh, as I understand, Food waste basically comprises two uh, parts. First is um, after-meal food waste with uh, lipid or oil, and the other part is uh, before the meal. So will anything be done in relation to these two processes so that training can be provided to separate these two, and so that um, the separation of food waste can be more effective? Now, uh, the second question. I see that there are energy saving targets in the paper, but what is the actual benefit generated? I don't see that in the paper. For example, the energy consumption will be reduced by, say, how many percent this year, and this will become uh, a target for you and, and see if you can achieve this target. Um. In fact, one of the purposes of these trials and tests is to educate uh, yes. the people involved because I think um, it is important. One of the, the difficulty with food waste is the liquid content. Uh, if you're trying to compost, you have to somehow get rid of the liquids so that it gets dry enough to be composted. So that's exactly why we're trying, trialing this quite cautiously because it does require 
uh, our tenants to separate food at different stages, not just food, but for example, the packaging of that food. We don't want that mixed in. Plastics can cause havoc with it. So there's a whole process of education that we have to go through, and, and I agree with you, this is, this is something we've got to do. We think a, a practical trial, which we then share through the EMAC system, and people can see for themselves how it works, is probably a good way of doing this. Um, but yes, education on this one is, is absolutely essential, and that's why we're doing it this way. Chairman, can I follow up on this point? I'd like to know if HK will, as it attaches importance to this part, deploy more resources to EMAC so that EMAC can take the lead in this area. Mr. Pascal? We work very closely with our EMAC because uh, they are um, helping us to implement this. So yes, uh, you know, we put the, the appropriate resources with the, that we can to work with the EMAC on these things and uh, indeed we, we regularly have sessions, joint sessions with EMACs from throughout the estates, bring them together that, so they can share with each other as well. So we, we are working with the EMACs on this one definitely. <laughs> Chairman, I do attend EMAC meetings, but in fact, I see that for the work of EMAC in this area, they stay at the superficial level, like holding of uh, carnivals. So I think that concrete targets should be set. For example, if you want to educate the public in the coming year, there should be a set of you know, concrete um, target and a packaged uh, model. Uh, the other part about energy saving targets. Now, as shown in the chart in 2011, the energy consumption is compared with the base year figures in 2007, and you see that it has been reduced by uh, so and so percentage. And this is our target, and we'll continue our work in this regard. So, what is the target for the upcoming year? It's been reduced down to 37. So, for 12, 13. For this dot in blue, this will be the target consumption in the coming year. Now, I just want to say uh, that for estate offices, I think that as far as electricity consumption is concerned, more can be done to reduce it. Uh, we have an overall target, but thank you for the reminder. Dr. Kokaki, Chairman. Uh, HA has indeed made a lot of effort. They deserved our support and about energy efficiency. Between 2007 and 2011, altogether there was a reduction of 4.5%, and that is annually speaking 0.9%. And it seems to us that uh, this is not a t uh, an aggressive target at all. Now, in the small hours in the communal areas or corridors, will you consider reducing the intensity of lighting? Say, for example, only half of the lights will be turned on because illumination accounts for the largest share of energy consumption in housing estates. Apart from using LED's lighting system, will you come up with ways, say, for example, automatic uh, switches, and I'd like you to give me more information on LED lighting systems. Say, in the coming two years, uh, how much more are you going to install? Now, the other point is about a bastos. It is a harmful substance. All um, construction materials containing asbestos should have been removed. So I'd like to know your progress and how much more will be demolished in the coming year. As for food waste recycle, recycling program, uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, not many of us will say this is successful. So only five states will take part in the one of the trial schemes. How many more will take part in it? Ms. Fung? Deputy Director, let me briefly respond to the point about energy efficiency or energy consumption reduction. 
Actually, 5% in five years is in line with the administration's requirement. But let's not forget that we have started our work in 1999. So initially, our reductions had been quite substantial. It's not shown in this chart, but I can supply this information after the meeting. There was a substantial reduction back then. So it seems that over the years, the reductions do, did not seem uh, aggressive, but uh, in terms of the use of LED or automatic switches, we will look into these uh, things further and see if we can further reduce electricity consumption. As for asbestos, at present, there are still 19 housing estates with 38 domestic blocks containing uh, asbestos materials. Now about this information, it's in the estate offices and also on the website on uh, or the HA's website, and we will continue to manage this information and to protect the public safety for asbestos materials. In fact, we uh, have either demolished them or enclose them or they may be uh, at a low risk state. I'm sorry, Chairman, I'm running out of time. I'm asking when they will be demolished. So please tell me when. Well, if it is not the turn of a particular block to be demolished, uh, then we won't demolish it. But there's a chance still to demolish it uh, when we're to redevelop the whole estate. What about food wastes? We're still in an initial stage in our program. As the Permanent Secretary said, we'll continue to monitor the situation. Any objectives? The objective is to monitor the existing estates. Dr. Fernando Chang, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, of course, support the administration's and the department's effort in reducing wastes. As mentioned just now, some efforts were not specific enough and they acted too slowly. There is still in a pilot stage and they're only talking about a few estates. Why can't the program be extended to all estates? Why can't they expedite the program? As regards reduction of wastes at source, the households should, as far as possible, reduce wastes, and the department should get the wastes recycled and reused as far as possible. Does the social enterprise sponsored by commercial operators and supermarket coupons are distributed to the households as incentives? That proves to be rather effective. Why can't they extend the program to all estates? As for the segregation facilities, the existing coverage is still not enough. The information I have in hand is that only 20% of the estates are covered. Can you tell me the coverage rate of uh, those estates uh, with uh, segregation facilities on every floor. And can you not further support the NGO or social enterprise in question? I think the, the, the simple answer is why can't we go any faster is that, frankly, we're already moving as fast as we think is appropriate. The reason is we're not talking about something that uh, we are set up to do. We are a housing authority. We're not a waste recycling authority. I have to rely on external advice and support to allow us to do these things. And I want to make sure that first and foremost, the safety of my tenants is looked after. That's the priority. Beyond that, everything else is secondary. Having said that, 
we want to extend these things, but I can't go full tilt when I have serious concerns about the viability of the tests that we're doing. I must assess those tests. So we have taken a view that the first two tests that are carried out before on-site composting, perhaps not sufficient. So we're now looking at the second phase, which is off-site composting, and we're doing that on a more ambitious program with five uh, estates. If that proves successful, then of course we will roll it out as quickly as we possibly can. Of course, subject to us being able to deal with the problems that I've described earlier, which include the ability to separate the waste at, at the domestic unit, where are they going to store it before it's collected? Secondly, the ability for us to collect it centrally and store it before it's collected by the off-site user. Uh, and thirdly, of course, that we don't produce any such enormous volume that they can't cope with it. Because, let's be honest, high-density living like ours will produce an enormous volume of waste. That's the basic problem. So there are issues that we have to deal with, and these are real, genuine, practical issues that have to be addressed. And I have to say I need to address those cautiously. Um, well, we're under time pressure. Second round. All right? Otherwise, all of you are exceeding your time. Mr. Michael Tan, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I'm here to learn. The director is here. Just now, it's mentioned that the average waste generated per person stood at uh, 0 0.7 kilograms in the last few years. What about Singapore? They also have a great deal of public housing. What are their average quantities per person? Have they also reached their saturation point? Have they been improving and improving? So I think we should take reference from them so that we can improve ourselves as well. What about LED technology is ever advancing? Every day we have new products. Now, you've tested that certain products can save electricity. Are you going to use such devices in new estates only? What about the old estates? And when will the next cycle come? After you've used up your money, the next generation of products will come online and you need to renew them as well. Now, science and, and technology are ever advancing, and you would like to use the state-of-the-art technology. So will you only act on the new estates, whether up the old estates, or after you've uh, acquired uh, some new products? The next generation is coming. Mr. Pascott? I don't have figures for Singapore, but I can say I was at a conference last week where the Singapore Housing Development Board were present. They share exactly the same problems we share in terms of um, the space constraints, etc. I don't know what the exact figures are, but I would say that if you look at um, our public housing tenants by comparison to the overall Hong Kong population, they're actually pretty good. Um, I think that their, uh, their production is lower generally per household than, than, the, than the average. Um, talking about the second question on, on uh, technological advances, in fact, um, we do monitor the situation very closely. Uh, we, one of the reasons we're doing various tests with uh, LED lighting, um, dual level lighting systems and what have you, is that uh, if, if they work successfully in new estates, then of course we could consider how best to implement them in our older estates. Um, I, I can just say So you will roll out to existing if, estates? If it's working, yeah. I mean, for example, we're replacing uh, the ballasts, the electronic ballasts, mm. in, in all of our estates, and that program is, is being rolled out to the old as well as the new estates. So when we find a product that works, we'll roll we it out. We will roll out. Yeah, that's all the right, So that's the strategy, right? Because yeah. it has to be. We don't want to do something and then find that we've invested a lot of money that isn't workable. Hi, hi, hi. Oh. Well, Mr. Chairman, I still have one minute. One more simple question. In overseas jurisdictions, greening is done at grade, that is, on the ground surface. And they look good. And in Hong Kong, I really don't know why we always need a concrete planter which stretches for over 10 feet. Such planters don't look warm. 
Is it a maintenance issue or what? Throughout the whole world, uh, nowhere else do they do greening by having all these concrete planters. Well, if we can do greening at grade, we'll do so. And if we can do it uh, at the ground level, we'll do so. We we do so in some of our parks and gardens. And sometimes, uh, by the side of planters, we can erect benches for people to sit on. So you try as far as possible to do greening at grade. Yes, but that is not happening in many parks. Well, the new parks is always at grade. Mr. Alan Leon, Mr. Chairman, from the PowerPoint presentation, I could see that near the end, in paragraph 39, it said that uh, they will continue to enhance staff environmental awareness and knowledge by organizing environmental campaigns. Now, what about these environmental campaigns? Uh, what do they cover? What are their contents? My second question is not about staff. It's about the tenants. I know that in some private housing estates, in order to solicit their help in recovering wastes. They sometimes organize games such that they can exchange items for items. For example, used glass bottles and aluminium cans on a day in a week. The tenants can hand over these items to a collection point and with say a few dozens of aluminium cans a child can get three pencils. Now for PRH tenants, can such games be organized also to encourage the tenants to get involved uh, what about uh, such games and barter systems, so to speak? A simple answer for our staff. Every year we organize activities in which our staff are encouraged to provide used items to recovery agents for transfer to the needy. And then on every floor in our office, we have recovery bins to segregate wastes. Ms. Alice Mack asked whether we attained our objectives. Yes, we actually exceeded our targets. We collected much more items than we expected. And we have something like an exchange square, so to speak, in every estate, uh, there's a time in a year for exchange of items. And every year, at different times, we organize such activities uh, for different estates. So, environmental campaigns are organized in various estates. Well, Mr. Chairman, a follow-up question. I understand that in some privatizing estates, they try to commission outside agencies to recover the used materials because such materials can actually reap profits. Uh, that's why they're using pencils, rulers, etc. as incentives for the children. So will you invite such agents into your PRH estates? Well, let me answer this. Mr. Lau? In fact, on the ground floor of every building, we have recovery bins for different items. At regular times, we set up such recovery stations in our estates. Uh, of course, not on a day-to-day -day basis, but maybe weekly or monthly. So it's something like a barter system. The tenants exchange items among themselves. Well, time's up. Uh, well, I'll ask my first round questions. Yeah. 
say if the tenant withdraws from the tenancy, the in um, the um, internal uh, decoration might still be useful for the tenants coming in, and you may not require the tenant to demolish all the internal decoration. Well, will you? Uh, are you going to? Um, Comprehensively introduce this policy. A point on environmental protection, Mr. Lang. We also attach importance to more um, greening, and uh, materials should be reused and recovered as far as possible. So, where the there is no contravention of the building ordinance and no fire service. Um, safety problems and where it, the design is suitable. The items left by the former PH tenant, for example, the flooring, tiles, and the stove cabinets in the kitchens can remain based on the principles that I mentioned. All right. Members, two members have raised their hand. Uh, they want to ask questions in the second round, but we are running out of time, and we still have one agenda item to go, and this is also uh, of members' concern. So please follow up um, with the administration after the meeting. Let us move on to any other business, the remaining item. Well, although it's called the remaining item uh, or any other business. In fact, this is important because we have to discuss the setting up of a subcommittee on the long-term housing strategy. LC paper CB bracket 1222 slash 1213 bracket 02. And that is a paper prepared by the LACHCO Secretariat on the setting up of the subcommittee on the long-term housing strategy. Mr. Duncan Pascott will take part in the discussion of this item. And on the 5th of November, at this panel meeting, a member of this panel, Mr. Abraham Schacht, put forward this proposal for a subcommittee to be set up. And we do need to have a lengthy discussion today. Just indicate whether you support the setting up of this subcommittee. If you support it, the Secretariat will then circulate the form to invite members to join the subcommittee. On the terms of reference and the functions, members can speak on these relevant matters. Now, Mr. Abraham Shack, the proposer, the proponent, can uh, speak first, uh, followed by other members. Thank you, Chairman. On the 5th of November, during the meeting, I make this proposal as the Administration has a committee on long-term housing strategy. We should have a subcommittee on the long-term housing strategy. Very often, the administration's committee will com will complete its work before uh, the electrical is consulted. So we are unable to know in advance their position and the uh, outcome of their studies. Actually, uh, they conduct meetings on a monthly basis, and this is important to the long-term housing strategy in Hong Kong, and that's why I proposed to set up this subcommittee. In paragraph 7, on the proposed work plan of the subcommittee, I support it, so I support the setting up of this subcommittee. Okay, please be... Uh, concise because our meeting should end at 4:30. Dr. Lam Tai Fai, I support Mr. Abraham uh, Shack's proposal. For the, this new term of government, land and housing is uh, one of the top priorities, and so far the problems have not yet been resolved. All the measures, where well, they are just a stopgap measures, they're not targeting the problem at source. And in order to prevent the steering committee on long-term housing strategy to work behind closed doors, we, 
as the government watchdog should also monitor the government by setting up a subcommittee. Otherwise, it will be dereliction of duty on our part. So we should be responsible for monitoring the administration. We should make sure that they don't just listen to their own views uh, inside the chamber, but listen to our views as we are backed by public mandate. Collective wisdom should be pulled, and we should um, refer to the terms of reference of the uh, steering committee and come up with our own terms of reference because it's like we're just um, helping them collectively. So uh, the terms of reference, the functions, etc., we can all follow the those of the steering committee so as to help the administration resolve the top problems. Dr. Fernando Chan, the Labour Party also supports Mr. Shack's proposal. Long-term housing strategy is important. I recall that in 1996, the LegCo had a similar subcommittee, which was also the counterpart of the steering committee of the administration. Back then, the research division of the LegCo secretariat also prepared four reports, including land supply, housing demand, etc. These reports were very useful. I hope that uh, work will be done in this regard after this committee is set up. There should be up-to-date information. I also want a subcommittee uh, to be set up on inclusive education under the education panel. I don't know uh, whether uh, any available slot will be given to that subcommittee, but anyway, I support Mr. Shack's proposal. Mr. Eleanor, on behalf of the Civic Party, I also indicate our party's support for Mr. Shack's proposal. Long-term housing strategy is very important. It is a good thing that we have a counterpart unit. I am a member of the FTU, and I myself, as a member, not as chairman, express support for Mr. Shack's proposal. At the joint panel meeting of the Housing and Development Panel, I raised three questions. I urge the administration to reply to me the statistics in relation to land and housing supply. Few few weeks passed and I received a piece of paper uh, with a short paragraph as the answer. It has fallen short of my expectation. So I also look forward to a subcommittee on the long-term housing strategy to be set up under the panel on housing. I think it's appropriate that we have this subcommittee. Mr. Pascal, Permanent Secretary, now you have heard the views expressed by members. It seems that we have unanimous support and uh, your response, please, P.S. Mr. Chairman, I think this is a matter for the members, really. If members set up a committee, we'll do our best to uh, comply. Oh. All right. I'm very happy to hear that uh, Mr. Pascot says um, that we will try our best to comply. Um, it's very useful. This comment is very useful. So. If there are no objections, then the subcommittee on the long-term housing strategy under the panel on housing will be established. And after the meeting, the electrical secretariat will be circulating a form on the membership of the subcommittee, followed by election of chairman and the items to be included on the agenda, and the administration can then send their representatives to our meetings. All right, no other views? All right, please uh, enroll after the meeting. Enroll with the secretariat. You can also raise your hands now. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for indicating your interest in membership. Uh, other members can join as well, of course. Uh, other members who are not present. So meetings adjourned. Thank you.